The following is a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Everyone in here has something in common. Sure, there are differences. There are unique things about each one of us here. There are distinctive features about how we look or how we've been raised or life that we've already encountered. There are, of course, these different points of independence and personalities that we can understand and appreciate and identify about each other. And yet, there are some things that we all have in common. One of those is that we all have a past. We all have a past. No one just arrived here now. You have gone through life for some length of time, for some span of time already in some respect as you've already interacted. We've not traveled yet, though, the same path. We have, therefore, do not have the same past. Some of us look back in our past, we look back in time, and we smile. Those are good days. A fond recall. Sweet memories. Good friendships. Great time in school. Perhaps maybe it was even something as recent as this weekend or this past month. Or maybe a, a decade or even more ago, but nevertheless. But others of us, when we look back on our past, we don't smile. We frown. We grimace. Maybe not the residual effects of physical pain, but perhaps spiritual pain. Perhaps emotional pain. Some of us feel imprisoned by our past, and we want to break free from it. Well, this morning, we're going to learn from Deuteronomy about how our past can help us, how it can help us. Now, as a sidebar, I will also share just briefly in a few minutes some lessons about how to deal with your past as a greater point of application for you to consider yourself and even possibly sharing with other people but we're going to spend, spend our time in Deuteronomy, thinking through this lesson in great understanding. As you can see on the screen, our title of our sermon this morning is Testify, Why Your Past Helps You Know How to Live Unto God and Before Others. And Before Others. Now, we are in a large section of Scripture this morning two and a half chapters from the middle of chapter 24 all the way through the end of chapter 26, a significant section of Scripture. Now, it's been a practice of mine these last couple of weeks. I've been doing some things on my car. Now, for those of you who do not know, I, I drive a classic car. I don't know why there's laughter. It's not a 57 Chevy. It's not a 65 Mustang. It's an 03 Honda Element EX. It's classic because they don't make them anymore. At least that's what I'm calling it, a classic car. And I have needed to replace some things in the Element, and I've recruited the help of one of my sons recently, and we learned how to pop the, the center trim off of the dash, take out AC parts and changing the light bulbs behind these things, and honestly, I... I felt like a certified mechanic in the moment. For those of you who know what it's like to do a home improvement project or something like that, once it's done, you kind of have a bit kind of a moment there where you kind of feel like, hey, if you guys need anything, I'm here for you. <laughs> My wife inevitably can tell when I've come back from some successful mission because I'll come in and I might just look at her like this. <laughs> She'll know he must have done something impressive to himself. Or maybe if it's not so obvious, I'll give it away and say, hey, I'll waive the $85 labor rate this time for you <laughs> just because I love you. It's the kind of things I do as a husband. <laughs> but nevertheless, I was working on my car, and so I thought, well, you know what? That went so well. I'm working on changing these light bulbs on the AC fixture. I'm thinking about now I'm going to plug in a Bluetooth adapter to the back of the head unit so I can have wireless capacity there. I'm getting pretty excited. And then I got the idea, you know what I need? And notice how I say that, need, not want. No, I need. I need remote starter for my car. 
winter's coming, it gets cold outside, sometimes the car's outside, snow comes. You know, I did move here from Los Angeles. You guys should feel bad for me. I think I should deserve a remote starter. My wife would say, oh, I'll see you on. I'm from Miami, Florida. I definitely deserve a remote starter. So I got to thinking, I wonder what it'd be like to install a remote starter. And so I watched the infamous YouTube. Yes. Which is filled with all kinds of crazy videos. Some helpful, some not so much. It was only once I watched an installation video too of a remote starter, I thought, okay, I'm not a mechanic. I'm not doing that. Because this guy, he is like under the dash, he's pulled off the steering column, he's got the wiring exposed, he's cut away part of like the plastic sheath around the wires, and he's exposed probably no less than maybe 15 to 20 wires. And they're differing in diameter, and he's talking like this is like pedestrian, which to him and his fellow installers, I suppose it is. But to me, Mr. Classic Car Owner, not so much. And he's talking about, you got to dig in here and you got to separate the major wires from the minor wires. You can see the major wires just pulling them out. And I'm like, okay, oh, what's going major? Red, yellow, orange. Can we just go by colors? I can do colors. And then he's talking about how you're going to tap into them and how it's going to connect this horn and you're going to connect these different things. I'm like, okay, I'm definitely out on this deal. Out. Because there's so many things wrapped up in there that I'm like, I just cannot track with all of that. Friends, this morning... We're going to get into the steering column of Deuteronomy. And we're going to have a bunch of different issues addressed. And it's going to seem, honestly, curious at times, confusing at times, that we might be just tempted to think, you know what? I I'm not a professional. I'm not a professional. Let's let the professionals take care of this. And you just tell us at the end, Mr. Professional, what to do about it. Well, what we're going to do, similar to what that guy was trying to teach me to do, we're going to get in there and just sort of pull out the major wires in this case, the major themes of Deuteronomy chapter 24 through the end of 26 and see them as tying these other ones together. So with your attention, please look at Deuteronomy chapter 24. Picking up where we left off last week in verse 8. I'll read some of the text. We won't go through all two and a half chapters, but just to begin to give you a feel for it. Verse 8, take care in a case of leprous disease to be very careful to do according to all that the Levitical priest shall direct you. As I commanded them, so you shall be careful to do. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way as you came out of Egypt. When you make your neighbor alone of any sort, you shall not go into his house to collect his pledge. You shall stand outside, and the man to whom you shall make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. And if he is a poor man, you shall not sleep in his pledge. You shall not restore to him the pledge as the sun sets. He may sleep in his cloak and bless you. And it shall be righteousness for you before the Lord your God. You should not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. Fathers, do not be put to death because of their children. Sh excuse me, shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. For each one shall be put to death for his own sin. You shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless or take a widow's garment and pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheath in the field, you shall not go back to it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. You shall remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt, therefore I command you to do this. Now, I'll stop right there, though we're only half of a chapter into the two and a half chapters for our, our time together this morning. What I want you just to kind of briefly understand is what we've been talking about in the previous couple of months. Deuteronomy, by principled application and explanation, is an elaboration on the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, in some form or fashion. And you can see this in Deuteronomy chapter 24 here. 
And what we're seeing in Deuteronomy chapter 24, particularly verses 8 through 16, is dealing with this issue of false speaking. Things need to be confirmed, need to be validated, and how things are to be handled and how people should be addressed. Then later on in chapter 24, verse 17 and following, through the end of chapter 26, really connects back to the 10th commandment, which is you shall not covet. So the first part was the 9th commandment about lying or false speech. And then chapter 24, verse 17, through chapter 26 to the very end, is dealing with you shall not covet. Now, I've talked about these themes, these sort of major wires in the text I want to pull out for you, because I don't want you to make the mistake to think, well, as, Eric, as I, as I read this, as I look at Deuteronomy, I'm going to be honest, um, we don't, I'm not dealing with leprosy today. That's just not something I'm coming to. I've never had to go over to my neighbor's house in verse 10 and say, hey, you pledged to me, you were going to pay me back what you owed me, and you pledged me with your coat, which is what's going on here, your tunic. And um, I, I want to go ahead and give it back to you because it's going to be a cold night tonight and you're not going to be cold if you don't have it to sleep in. This would be like you saying, you know what, Eric, I don't own that classic car that you have, so I don't need to learn how to worry about those kind of things you're asking about. The truth is there are some common features here regardless of the time that we still need to recognize for today. So let me highlight for you those themes because we've already begun to see two of them without even perhaps even realizing it. The first theme that we need to recognize is remembering our past. Remembering our past. I want you to see in Deuteronomy 24 through 26, this theme of remembrance is repeatedly referenced. We've referenced it already three times this morning. Chapter 24, verse 9. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way as you came out of Egypt. Verse seven, uh, excuse me, verse 18, you shall remember that you are a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Verse 22, you shall remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt, therefore I command you to do this. Again, it continues, 25, verse 17, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt. And he goes on to explain that story, how the Lord God gave you rest from all your enemies. And then it continues... Again, in chapter 26, verses 5 through 9 is a larger elaboration of this. Talking about the reflection, it says in verse 5 of Deuteronomy 26, you shall make a response before the Lord your God, and then here comes what they're to remember. A wandering Aramean, some of you might have Syrian as a translation, a wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, mighty and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice, and he saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. In verse 9, and he brought us into this place where they're headed next and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The first major theme here, the, the wiring that's connecting the circuitry of Deuteronomy here, that's really not just a theme for these two and a half sections of Scripture, two and a half chapters rather, but rather I would argue this is a major theme for all of Deuteronomy. All of Deuteronomy. And that is remembering your past. <coughs> remembering your past. And the significance here is important because of different ways he wants them to make sure they make the connection. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 9, when he speaks about this issue of remembrance, it's in the context of leprosy. Now, you'll notice what he's talking about here is he's dealing with a situation of leprosy that came up because of someone else's sin. For those of you not familiar with the story in the, in the book of Numbers, Miriam, relative of Moses, is, uh, and his brother Aaron are basically complaining to Moses about the woman he married. He's basically, he married a Cushite, which in modern day language, basically, he married an African woman. He married a black woman. This would be what we know referred to it today as an interracial marriage. They're complaining that he married this woman, this Cushite woman. It says specifically in the text in, in Numbers, they're complaining. What happens then is, 
because they're doubting Moses' qualification for this decision, and they're doubting the choice he's made, God teaches them a profound lesson, particularly Miriam, and he gives Miriam leprosy. She's divinely contracts leprosy as a judgment on her murmuring about Moses' decision, which is fascinating for a number of reasons, which time doesn't permit us to go into. But the point here, as he's now bringing up in Deuteronomy, is how this is a part of the story that they need to reflect back on, which in this situation is for the purpose, the purpose rather, of discouraging sin. You see, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 8, it says, Take care in the case of leprous disease to be very careful to do according to all that the Levitical priest shall direct you. As I commanded them, so you shall be careful to do. And then he gives us this sort of little impetus, this little motive, this reminder. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way as you came out of Egypt. Those who think they have a better plan that God's revealed plan, as given by, in this case, the situation with Moses, will reap the consequence of that. Will reap the consequence of that. And this theme of remembrance is not only one of correction, it's also one of encouragement. And this continues throughout. So when we think about remembering our past, I want you to think about remembering our past with this intention. Number one, it discourages sin. It discourages sin. Part of this is you reflect back on the consequence of decisions made by yourself or by others, and you decide presently, I don't want to do that. I don't want to commit that action. In this case, I don't want to be like Miriam. Secondly, you can see there, it motivates compassion. If you look in chapter 24, verse 17, you have this repeated theme going through the text about how to treat others, which we're going to address in a second. But it speaks in verse 18 about, you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Now, why is he talking about this? Because in verse 17, he's talking about perverting justice that's due to other people. What he's talking about here is that their act of remembrance, their act of reflection on the past should motivate them in their compassion towards other people. As they have identified, they've received it themselves, so they're more inclined to offer it to others. Third, you can see here in the text, It encourages grace. Look at verse 22. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Why would this happen? What would this go on here? Because of what it says earlier in verses 19 and following about how to care for people. See, here's the deal. By definition, these parts of land that people live on belong to them. It's their crops. It's their land. It's it's their domain. And you could make an argument that to the letter of the law, in some contexts, that everything on it belongs to them. And here in the earlier verses, Moses is teaching the people that when they do inherit this land, when they do receive this land, that they are to go over it and to kind of reap the harvest of the crops there, but they're to leave some for others. The sojourner, people passing through, the widow, the the woman whose husband has died and cannot have provision made for herself, the orphan, the, the person, the child whose parents have both died and has no ability to be provided for, that there should be grace. How would this grace come? By verse 22, remembering that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And notice the contrast. They were a slave, and now they're talking about reaping their harvest in their fields. You know what that is? That's grace. That's receiving something you do not deserve. Remembering your past encourages grace towards other people. The third part of how you remember your past or what it accomplishes is that it, excuse me, fourth part is that it also strengthens your faith. Strengthens your faith. If you look in chapter 25, verse 17, talking about these different laws here, he says in verse 17, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, those who are lagging behind you, and he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. What's happening here? It strengthens the faith of God's people to remember how he's provided from the past. Now, what's the context here? The context is two million people, the Israelites, are trying to pass through a land that belongs to Amalek And the king in that area is like, 
No, you can't pass through. Furthermore, if you come this way, I'm going to attack you. Furthermore, I'm attacking you. Later on, God tells him, tells Moses that he is to attack Amalek to pay him back. And this is the battle in Numbers where Moses is so weary that the battle is going on, on and on and on. And when his arms drop, the Israelites begin to lose. And when his arms are up, they go back to winning. And they finally have to drag over like a big rock for Moses to sit on. And then they hold up his arms. And Joseph, uh, Joshua rather, who's like his aide de camp at this time, is literally like holding up his arms as a declaration of God's victory for them. And then they end up winning. And what's happening here is it's like, hey, just like God provided for you in the past and remembered his promises then, so will he in the future. This should be strengthening to your faith. The, fir- the fifth feature to remembering your past is that it fuels your worship. It fuels your worship. If you jump ahead to verse 20, chapter 26, verse 5, a passage I read to you already where it talks about a wandering Aramean. Some of your translations might say a wandering or traveling Syrian. This is referring to Jacob. Jacob, uh, who was each Israelite's father and ancestor, when he fled his home in Beersheba, he passed through Syria to Mesopotamia. And he lived with Laban, his uncle. Returning from there, Jacob was overtaken by Laban after he came out of Syria. And as a result of that, he was then have to uh, be restored back to his own brother later on. And what's happening here in the text is that eventually they go down into Egypt where initially they're well received, but then they're put into slavery. And what ends up happening, as it says there in verse 8, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. When seemingly all circumstances were against them, when all promises had been forgotten, when all faith had failed, the Lord remembered his promises. And with a great and mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. So, listen. The past has opportunity for you to learn from, to grow from. It discourages sin, it motivates compassion, encourages grace, it strengthens your faith, and it fuels your worship, which we'll further see here in the response to God. Now, let me just give a brief sidebar on dealing with your past. Later on this week in our Thursday email that we send out to all of you who are on that email list, I'll put a link to this article that I encourage you to read. It's a well-recommended article about dealing with your past. This is a challenge for many people, and I, I don't think I could say as well as uh, Pastor Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who used to live in England, said, look at the quote I have here for you. The problem here is the case of those who are miserable or who are suffering from spiritual depression because of their past, either because of some particular sin in their past or because of the particular form which sin happened to take in their case, meaning something they did or something that someone did to them. He goes on and says, I would say that in my experience in the ministry, extending now over many years, there is no more difficulty. It is constantly reoccurring, and I think I have had to deal with more people over this particular thing than anything else. Summarize that for you. Our pasts have really messed us up. And we stay in that perpetual problem of being messed up if we do not handle that past correctly. I'm thankful for Pastor Robert Jones who wrote an article titled, Redeeming the Bad Memories of Your Past Sins, this link that I'll give to you the future this week. He speaks about their goal is not memory eraser, it's not memory denial, but memory transformation. He speaks about specifically 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17, and he teaches us how to consider our past, learning from Paul's example, and how he learned from his past. It can deepen your repentance, it can give you a heightened gratitude for grace, and it can give you a broader effectiveness in helping others. These are three features to our past that sometimes are often missed because we're in this broken cycle that continually happens over and over and over again. Well, turning to our text, as that's a resource I want to provide for you in the future, returning to our text, let's go to our second major theme here, weaving its way through this section of Scripture, and that is living with 
others, living with others. From chapter 24, verse 8, all the way down, really into chapter 25 to the end, it's interacting with how we interact with other people in society and how we do so. And if you could say the small wires, thinking about the circuitry of Deuteronomy, the small wires are lepers, loaning money, oppression of employees, parental responsibility, benevolence of those struggling, the death of a spouse, two men fighting. This is pretty mind-boggling. Deuteronomy 25, verse 11. Look there. This is not one that often gets read to the kids at family devotions. But hey, I'll take us there. When men fight with one another and the wife of the one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of him who is beating him and puts out her hand and seizes him by the private parts, then you shall cut off her hand. Your eye shall have no pity. Now, I just want to say this morning, I do not intend to exposit that text. But I did want to read it to you and remind you of all the things that the Bible addresses that you didn't know. But teenagers will now declare some of their favorite texts of Scripture. <laughs> My point is, you have a number of circumstances and a variety of issues being addressed here. And every single one of these as sort of being connected back to our interaction and our relationship with other people. How we treat others. There's a corresponding effect to recognize how we have been treated motivates us in how we interact and treat others. Part of this I've touched on already, but I want to be explicit now as you begin to see this throughout the text. As you begin to realize there is a corresponding effect for how you think of others based upon how God has treated you. See, for Christians, this is fundamentally important because it highlights and emphasizes what might explain is some missing mindset that you have right now and some relationships you have. In other words, inevitably, we have dozens of people, perhaps even more than 100 or so people in this room, maybe even everybody in this room at one time or another already has and knows and currently is experiencing broken relationships. Sometimes that's with older adult parents. Sometimes that's with younger adult children. Sometimes that's with friends or coworkers. There have been wrongs truly committed. And I'm not trying to pass judgment to which one of you is right in that sort of assessment of right versus wrong. But I want to say there's truly wrongs being committed. There's been significant issues being done there. The problem comes not in trying to call bad good. I'm not advocating for that in any way, but rather in being able to recognize that before we take assessment of how that is being addressed and what would make it right in your eyes, you have to ask yourself the question, what is an even greater offense that's taken place that you and I can learn from? Well, that offense is the one that we have had against God himself. You see, friends, while we were all created in the image of God and therefore have great dignity and great significance, the truth is every one of us has sinned against God. And as sinners, we have offended him and, and really attempted to defame his, defame his holiness. What I want you to see, though, is what God does with us. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 speaks about how it is that we have this peace with God. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, we have now been justified by his blood. Earlier in verse 8 it says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See friends, the Bible speaks openly and candidly and honestly about relational conflict. There is no greater relational conflict that man can know than the conflict he has between God and his creator. But God did not wait on man to initiate that reconciliation. He instead initiated towards man. He sought man out. He sent his son. He understood that without his initiating work in his life, that as a dead man, he could not save himself. He could not make himself alive. My point here is how that informs us in our relational instincts towards other people. 
we are motivated to show love towards others because of how we have remembered God has shown love towards us. Because while you read Deuteronomy, you might think it is so culturally far from any experience you've had. Friends, it's closer than you realize. Because while you are maybe not in slavery in Egypt, you were, if you are a Christian today, in slavery to your sin. While you maybe did not serve Pharaoh as your taskmaster, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, you did serve the prince of the power of this air, Satan himself. Jesus, in his own words, described you in your past tense as being a child of the devil. Satan, the father of lies. Now, think about your testimony. Think about how remembering that former self that former background, and all God did to initiate that to reconcile the relationship now then motivates you towards others in such a way that you pursue them and love them. And that's what's undergirding all of these different commands of Deuteronomy 24 and 25 is this love for others because of how they have realized God has loved them. How calmly it says here, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. The Lord did it. We didn't do it. What does this look like in action? Humility. Good relational chemistry requires practicing humility. Good relational chemistry requires practicing humility. You can't just claim it. Quite honestly, the minute you, the minute you do, you've essentially lost it. You have to demonstrate it. You have to seek others out. You have to position yourself with an attitude of grace and mercy, of pardon and forgiveness. Now, our first theme in Deuteronomy here, remembering our past. Our second theme, living with others. Our third theme that is profoundly sort of put front and center in Deuteronomy chapter 26, and that is loving God. Loving God. Look at the text here with me. Verse 1 of chapter 26. When you came, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, what shall you do? You shall take some of the first of the fruit of the ground which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose, and you shall make his name to dwell there. You shall go to the priest who was in office at the time and say to him, I declare today that the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And then they review the testimony of what I read earlier in verses 5 through 9. And then it says there in verse 10, and Behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground which you, O Lord, have given me, and you shall set it down before the Lord your God. And worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you. And to your house, you and the Levite and the sojourner who is among you. Friends, as you think about your past and how God has saved you, it should be an obvious connection, but one that nevertheless is explicitly told to us here. We should love God. And we do this in two primary ways here in the text. Number one, we worship God. Him. Do you notice that there in verses 10 and 11? You come before the Lord, you worship Him, you rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you. Sunday time of worship is not the only time in which Christian worship. We believe all of life can be expressed in a worshipful response. But we would say corporate worship is a time of climactic time of corporate worship together. We're all gathered together. When you came in this morning, to worship. And this is a question everybody to reflect on right now. When you came into worship, how much of your testimony from just this past week to your life, however long it's been since you've been a Christian, how much of that informed how you thought about what was going to happen here? How you read of those words on the screen when we were singing songs. How you listened along to Psalm 103 as it was being read to you. As Chris was on our behalf confessing our sins to the Lord and being reminded of our forgiveness because of Christ alone. How how much of that were like, yes, yes, 
Amen. Somebody give me a tambourine. Come on. Praise the Lord. See, there's a corresponding relationship of a recognition of what God has done for you and then what you do in response to the Lord. Being before Him, worshiping Him, rejoicing in all that He has given to you. Was that your testimony this morning? Is that your reputation with others? Or is this just where we're supposed to find you on a Sunday morning in Indiana? Because it's the Midwest. We're pretty good people. And we've got to renew our cultural Christianity because this is what we do. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I don't want you here. I'm saying these are things that sort of examine, test the motives. Why are we here? Now, for some of you, you're here because, yeah, like that's like what you do. Like this is where you're supposed to be. And you're finding your security with God based upon your church attendance. If that's, the, if that's true, then let me just gently tell you, that's actually not where you find security. You don't find it in your church attendance. Unfortunately, that's never gave you a perfect record. This is not even how God is judging us. The only way in which we can have confidence that we're accepted by God is through faith in His Son. Repenting of our sins and putting our faith in Him. That He died on the cross. He made payment for sins. He resurrected from the grave. And there's forgiveness in Christ. That's Romans 5, the shed blood of Jesus Christ by which, by which we've been justified. But for those of you who are Christians, for those of you who are here who are Christians, worship should be a reaction to your reflection on God's saving grace in your life. The second thing you can see here in the text, not only one of worship, but offering. Look at the reflection on sacrificial giving. I read it in verse 2 of chapter 26. It comes up again in verse 12. When you have finished paying all that the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of tithing, giving it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your towns and be filled. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion of my house, and moreover, I have given it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fathers, the widow, according to all the commandment that you have commanded me. I have not transgressed any of your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. One of our missionaries, Josh Wentz, who is a pastor in Turkey, who has told us in a previous time together that in his city, if I remember the number correctly, in his city of a couple million people, there are about 300 Christians. So a city larger than Indianapolis, 300 Christians. So think of the entire room of the entire city of Indianapolis and larger, all the Christians represented by just sitting in this room and not even everybody here would be counted. There's even, there's even less Christians in this city than there are even sitting in this room. And I asked him, I said, I'm curious, as a pastor, of so many people who've converted from Islam, what about something like giving? Do they have a cultural understanding of that in Islam, in the Middle East? Like, does that carry over? He said, oh no, they don't, they, it's not something that they teach in the Quran. He says, they, they do these occasional offerings, these occasional givings, but it's more like a super superstitious kind of token amount. But the idea of like regular sacrificial offering before the Lord, they don't do that. I was like, well, then I think it'd be really hard for pastors another ministry to be done if the people to whom the ministry is for give so little. He said, well, here's the weird thing. He said, I rarely have to teach on this that much. He said, because they give pretty significantly and generously out of reaction to the fact they're so blown away that the God of the universe forgave them of all their sins. I said, you know, that reminds me of the Christians I met in Japan who are coming from Buddhism and other religions, who do not have the same sort of scriptural backing of this sort of idea of charitable giving as a response and expression of, of, of worship of whatever the deity might be. But I've met Christians there who are giving 30, 40%. They've been giving just kind of like a radical, I'm trying to get your mind around, like what? And it was the same type of thing. It's like, well, because of their understanding of what they had been given and who they were in community together. The challenge, I think, for American Christians, not unique to us, but surely indicative of us, the challenge for us as American Christians is that we don't necessarily respond the same way naturally and as easily. And I wonder if that's because we're not as shocked by our salvation. Right? I mean, think about society. In our country, we just have this like low-grade entitlement that's running all the time. I'm entitled to a lot of things in this building. I'm entitled to a lot of things in my society. I am entitled to a lot of things at work. I have rights. 
This is a part of my personhood. That carries over even how we view God. Like God owes me. And the fact that I'm a Christian kind of makes sense. I mean, honestly, I don't mind to say it loud, but I'll kind of say it quietly. I mean, God's kind of glad I'm on his team. So that itself is like giving. I gave myself to his team. The fact that there's any more beyond that, come on, man. I got a pretty good life, so waiting to live. I got coworkers to keep up with. I got neighbors to impress. I've got, I've got possessions to acquire. I've got children to spoil. I've got grandchildren to sprinkle with blessings. Do not expect me to do anything more than I already am, which is, well, honestly, just be here. I wonder if that actually reflects perhaps no one in this room. But perhaps this low-grade temptation any one of us in this room might experience and therefore explain why this is a struggle for us. Whereas others who recognize, they remember the past, they came from slavery under the burden of a grievous, horrible taskmaster, and they now gladly give for whatever the Lord has given to them. Deuteronomy 26, at the very end, this promise he gives, verse 18, the Lord has declared to you today that you are a people for his treasured possession. He has promised you and that you are to keep all his commandments. He will set you in the praise and in fame and in honor high above all nations that he has made and that you shall be a people holy to the Lord your God as he promised. The significance here is how God keeps his word to his people. I think this is picked up for the Israelites even in Romans chapter 9 through 11. There's some comments to be made there. But even for the people of God, even today, who are, in the, who are in Christ by faith in Him and a part of the church and how He treats His people. Friends, this is a great place this week to do your devotions. Deuteronomy 26, to realize all that God has done for you in Christ. And may that motivate your worship of Him. May that motivate your love for others. And may that help you realize that your past does not define you but it does inform you how you can live in the present and the future to come. Let's pray. This has been a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church or our senior pastor, Eric Bancroft, please click on the link below or visit castleview.org.